Hello, everybody. Um, just going to take a moment to go over a shorter version of the final exam review. Um, this is a version that just has the hypothesis tests and confidence intervals, plus the correlation and regression problem. Um, so uh, we'll just go ahead and jump on in here. I'm going to assume that you're reading some of these uh, fine details that are discussed in the paragraphs here and go straight to computations. Um, so this, this first problem is the chapter nine problem. This is, this first one is going to be from section 9.1. And in section 9.1, um, you've got this thing called the correlation coefficient, which uh, you want to go ahead and have your calculator compute for you. Um, and so we, I won't ask you ever to compute this number uh, by hand, uh, but you will be computing the slope and the y-intercept for the line of best fit. Okay, so um, down below, I've already created the scatter plot on this example, which have amounts of sugar um, in 15 different breakfast cereals, and it's, it's a one serving amount of cereal. And these, uh, these amounts of sugar are in grams. Uh, the consumer reports rating just go on a one to 100 scale. So um, I've already uh, done a scatter plot of these points. Uh, and just to describe the visual appearance in terms of form, that's where you're going to say it looks linear or nonlinear, and direction, which is whether it goes downhill or uphill. So here, um, we'd say it's sort of a downhill straight line form. I'm not sure exactly where the line will go, but something like this. And knowing where a line would go is sort of admitting that it has a linear form. Okay, and um, the direction is downhill, which we call negative, because the slope is negative. Okay. Now, you also need to compute the correlation coefficient, which is R. Um, and as I've mentioned, um, the formula is up above, but we're using our calculator to do this. So what you want to do is put your calculator into the data editor mode that's this thing, and you would put um, both the X's in the first column and the Y's in the second column, and then you press clear, and uh, then you'll go second data and pick two variable stats and then just hit enter through all the questions, and you'll get a screen that has tons of stuff. Uh, if you go down far enough on the resulting screen, you'll see the R value that's here, and that's the one we want. I'll go ahead and do negative 0.698 for R here. Okay, like that. And then while we're at it, let's go ahead on the next problem. Oh, and by the way, um, we know that that indicates that the relationship is just moderate. So the, the rule for R is, let's do it with absolute values. If the absolute value of R is between negative 0.8, sorry, between, <laughs> I'm doing absolute values. So between 0.8 and one, uh, we just call this strong. Um, if we're going from 0.5 uh, to 0.8, that's moderate. Okay. And if we're between um, 0 and 0.5, that's weak. Okay. So here, um, the absolute value of R is 0 0.698, and that's about 0 0.7. And I think you can see that that will put it in the moderate category. So the relationship is moderate. I'll say moderately strong.
Okay. And that's that. So on the next page, uh, we want to go ahead and uh, get all the rest of the statistics. As I mentioned in the two variable statistics screen on the calculator, um, you get a ton of stuff. But among them, among those things that you get uh, will be the all the means and standard deviations for both variables. So I'll just go ahead and tell you what these are. Um, the mean of X was 7.6 mean of y was 41.2. The standard deviation of x, I'll put 3.869. And the standard deviation of y is 11.534. Okay, We already gave it, but the r value is still negative 0 0.698. Okay, and so now um, we're asking for the slope of the regression line. And again, as a reminder, um, the slope is this formula here, and then the y-intercept will be the next one below it. Okay, so this slope, oops, hang on, slope is r times sy over sx. So the r is negative 0.698. Um, SY is 11.534, and SX was the 3.869. There's a lot of rounding here, so there's going to be some error in this answer, but it's going to be approximately negative 2.08. I think if you do it without any rounding, it's negative 2.07. So it's pretty close, and it's close enough. Um, again, the Y-intercept formula, uh, I already showed, but I'll give it again. It's y bar minus the slope times x bar. Okay, so from above, uh, y bar is the 41.2 minus the slope, which is negative. So this is a double negative, 2.08 times uh, x, x bar, which is 7.6. Okay, don't forget this is a plus when you have a double negative. So uh, work that out and your wireship set comes out at about 57, 57.01. And that should, um, that's actually really close to what the calculator gives, but the calculator is just a little more accurate. Okay, the equation of the regression line is y hat equals the slope times x plus the y-intercept. Okay, so you need to leave x a variable when you write this. y hat equals the slope, which is negative 2.08, times x plus the y-intercept, which was 57, oops, 57.01. Okay, let's just go ahead and make that note again. Leave x a variable. Okay, until they give you a value for X. So in the next question, they say X is four grams of sugar. And we have to predict the Y hat value. So Y hat, just borrowing from the equation above, um, is negative 2.08. And the variable X is varied and become four plus the 57.01. And so that comes out to 48.69, which you would probably round if you were actually trying to make a prediction. You'd probably say that this consumer reports rating is predicted to be about 49. And that's that. Okay. Um, and there's one last thing I think I need to squeeze in here, which is I have we have to plot the line of best fit. It, it says so here. Um, use the values above. No, 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 no. Give the equation of the regression line, compute a few points, then graph the line on your scatter plot above. So the easiest thing to do to get your few points to graph is use the mean point, which is always on the line of best fit, and the y-intercept, 57.01. Okay, so 
the, the mean point is this 7.6, 41.2, which I've now added to the graph up here. And then again, the y-intercept was 57.01. You will have computed those. So it's no trouble really to plot them and uh, then just use a straight edge or something to uh, connect those with a straight line as such. I'm gonna tweak it just a little because I think the one that started a little low there. Maybe there. And like that, roughly like that looks good. All right, so there's our line of best fit. We're gonna go to the next one here. So uh, we'll just, I'm gonna pause for one second. Okay, so going to the next uh, problem here um, says that, uh, and it's this bit right here, that retailers report that the use of coupons is increasing. Um, Scripps News Service reported that from a random sample of 800 households that 616 um, are using coupons on a weekly basis. And there's some hints here about how to do the confidence interval, which is what it's about to ask us. It's a 90% confidence interval for a population proportion. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and just go through the steps here. Um, I think first we always like to check. So um, on this one, um, it says we need to verify that there are at least 10 successes and 10 failures. So we'll double check that. So the successes, Um, if you peek, it's 616. Those are the people using coupons. Um, the fails would be the sample size, which was 800 minus the successes. So anything that's not a success is a fail. Oops, I put 617 on both of these, but they're 616, my bad. Okay. Um, so that is um, don't see it. Okay, so that's one hundred and eighty four. Both of these need to be greater than or equal to 10. Of course they are. So we're good here with our criteria. Okay, so then the next thing uh, we would probably do is get our Z alpha over two. So um, if we go to table A2, and note that our alpha here is gonna be one minus 0.90. So that's 10%, 0 0.10. Okay, and for, uh, because, um, let me go ahead and put our z-score formula up here. So, <coughs> sorry, the margin of error formula over here, we'll say E um, is z sub alpha over two times the square root of p hat and q hat over n. Okay, so um, we need a z-score, the z-scores, critical values are in the bottom row of table A2. So down there where it says large and in parentheses Z is where the Z scores are stored. Um, everything else is a T score. Um, our alpha remember is 0 .0, sorry, 1, 0 0.10 and all confidence intervals are two tails. So make sure you do, you do two tails on this. Okay. Like that, and I think you'll see a 1.645 down there in the bottom row. Okay, we better do our P hat and our Q hat real quick. So the P hat that comes up in the margin of error formula is X over N. So the X, as we said before, is 616. 
n is 800. So I think you'll see this comes out to 0.77 exactly without any rounding. And then the q hat will be uh, 1 minus p hat. So 1 minus 0.77 should be 0.23. OK. Now um, let's go ahead and do this computation. So you've got the 1.645. Square root p hat 0.77 times q hat 0.23 over n that was 800. Okay, and if you round that to three significant figures, it's 0.0245. Okay, and that's that margin of error done. Okay, and then um, I think from there, we can go ahead and start working on the limits of the confidence interval. So we're going to have a lower limit, which is p hat uh, minus the margin for error, and of course, an upper limit. Okay, so the p hat is 0.77 minus the 0.0245. We'll end up rounding that a little bit more. And then plus okay, so on the subtraction side, you get 0.746. And on the high side, when you add 0.795, that's after a little bit of rounding. Okay. And um then we can just go ahead and put down the confidence interval. We don't know the population proportion. Should be between these two numbers, that is 0.746 and 0.795. And again, this is proportions of people that use coupons. So we can say we're 90% confident Um, that between 74.6% uh, and 79.5% of U.S. households um, use coupons um, weekly. And there you go. Next one. I think uh, we got some of the work already done here. Um, so if you take a look, um, we've got the ability, a study on people, the ability of individuals to walk in a straight line, which is hilarious. And what you have is um, a bunch of numbers that are unrelated to the straight line nonsense. But these are strides per second for um, a random sample of healthy men. Um, and stride per second, that's just how fast they walk. We'll, we'll call it cadence here. And I've already taken these numbers, put them in on one column of my calculator and got the standard deviation, the mean and the sample size here. So we'll be using as, that as we go through the problem, okay? Um, you can see it's, the problem's gonna ask us for a confidence interval for a population mean. And um, so all of this uh, is, is uh, outlined here that the sample size has to be bigger than 30 or the population has got to be normal. I guess while we're looking at it, let's go ahead and say it, the sample size is not bigger than 30, but we do have a bell-shaped distribution of data. Bell-shaped means normal. So this is not the whole population, it's just a sample. But the bell-shaped um, sample data uh, give evidence um, for normality in the population. And that's what we're interested in here. Okay, so um, 
I think we just go ahead and go through the steps that are outlined here. So criteria um, uh, for approximate normality first. So we'll do check um, that N is less than 30, but the histogram gives evidence for normality. Okay, so that's our first bit. Um, then the level of confidence and then the T off over two. So we'll go that route next. So um, level of confidence, 95%, you can see up here. So with 95% confidence, um, our alpha is one minus 0.95. So this is a 0.05 alpha, okay? And we want a critical value here. Um, so we're gonna look at table A2, which has all the Z, the Z and T critical values. T distribution has degrees of freedom. So for degrees of freedom, we're gonna do the sample size minus one, which um, there were 14 values in the sample. So we'll do 13 degrees of freedom. Look up our alpha of 0.05 and make sure it says two tails. Confidence intervals are always two tails. So like that. And I think what you'll see here is, hang on, um, 2.160. Okay. And that's all you really need to do the margin for error. So let's go ahead and do that next. <laughs> okay, so um, margin for error, simple little formula. It's T alpha over two times S over the square root of N. Okay, so the T alpha over two is the 2.160. And we got the standard deviation up on the previous page. So we're going to fill this in 2.160 times. And then up above, S is 0.048 and N is 14. Oops. Okay, so here, uh, that's gonna be 0.028. if you do that right. And now we can do the limits on our confidence interval. So um, we're doing X bar minus E and X bar plus E. Okay, so when you subtract, uh, so 0.951 for X bar minus E, which is 0 0.028, figure that out and then we'll add Okay, so the lower limit comes out as 0.923 strides per second, and the upper limit is 0.979. Okay, and then our interpretation down below, this time we are a little more 95% confident that the mean cadence of um, healthy men is between um, 0.923 and um, 0.979 strides per second. And again, there's a 90, basically 95% of the time we'll be right on this. Hopefully this is one of those times. Okay, so I got that one.
Okay, so we're going to do another one here. This one looks like we're going to be looking at a categorical data. Um, so this one says drug testing of job applicants is becoming increasingly common. Um, AP reports from a random sample of 600 app California applicants, 73 test positive, and we're going to do a, a, a hypothesis test. Where we're testing a claim about a proportion from a single population. Um, this one, um, we're going to have a null hypothesis that says that P is equal to some number. And we're going to use that to verify the criteria that NP is at least 10 and Q is at least 10, and then do this Z statistic, and then we'll go from there. Okay, so we'll go ahead and jump on in here. Our, you can see uh, we're testing a claim at 5% significance, so that's our alpha, 0.05. Uh, that more than 10% of California applicants are testing positive. So there's your alternative hypothesis. A proportion or percent is greater than 10%.10. The null, you just change that to an equal. So P equals 0 0.10. Like that. Okay, then the criteria, remember we just said that NP and NQ have to be at least 10. Okay, so um, if P is 10%, then I think it's pretty clear Q is one minus P. So this will be one minus 0 0.10, and that's 90%. Okay, so NP is gonna be, I think N600, yeah. So we got 600 applicants uh, times P, which is 0 0.10, and of course 10% of 600 is 60, and that's greater than or equal to 10. And Q will be 600 times a complement of 10%, which is 90%. And so that better be the um, 540 people. Uh, and of course that's at least 10 as well. And with both of those being at least 10, we have satisfied the criteria. Okay, now the test statistic is um, going to be the formula. Sorry, it's a Z test statistic. We only use T for means, and this is on proportions. So our Z statistic is P hat minus P over the square root of PQ divided by N. Okay, so I don't think we've done p hat. So over to the side, I think we'll do p hat. And I think it said, what did it say? 73 out of 600 were positive. And maybe we'll have to round this a little. Um, so it's 0 0.122 when you round it to three significant figures. Okay, and of course, q hat will be the complement. Oh, wait, there's no Q hat in the formula on this one, so we can skip that. If you look at the test statistic up here, it does have a Q, but not a Q hat down in the bottom, so I won't worry about that. Okay, so then we're ready to go with the computation. Um, so the P hat is 0.1, hang on, 0.122 minus P, which is 10% over square root, we're gonna do this PQ. So I'm gonna do 0 0.10 times 0 0.90 over N, the N was 600. All of that in a big square root. And when you evaluate it, um, you're gonna get 1.80-ish after you round it. Okay, so there's your test statistic. And then maybe we're going to do a critical value. I'll make a little space here. So for the critical value, we're going to do table A2. That's where pretty much all the Z and T critical values are. It says so on the table. Okay, it's Z. So for degrees of freedom, Z doesn't have degrees of freedom. We just say large. And Z as a reminder. And then our alpha was um, 0 0.10. And it's a one tail, sorry, no, 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 no. The alpha is 0 0.05. 
Okay, the alpha is 0 0.05. The 10% was from the null hypothesis. I was looking at that's different. Okay, so, and then this, um, with a 0.05, um, one tail, let me put that in as well, sorry. I think this is the second time we've seen a 1.645 here. Okay, and maybe we'll do a little picture. Okay, so our, our Z critical value is 1.6. Four five. That's our Z CV critical value. Okay, and then the test statistic is one point eight zero. So that we can probably make a note here that that's um, where we are as far as our Z test statistic. It's in the tail, so that makes it statistically significant, which means you've got evidence for the alternative hypothesis. Okay, now that p-value, I could almost take that last picture. Um, actually, I think I will. Okay, so I'm going to borrow this picture, put it over here. I don't really want that test statistic. Sorry, I don't want the critical value, my bad. I do want the test statistic, so let's move that up. Okay, so my Z test statistic was the um, 1.80. Okay, and then I want the tail that goes out past that. So just to the right of the test statistic is our p-value. Okay, and um, p-value is gonna be smaller than alpha. Remember, alpha is the tail that starts at the critical value. Okay, and if you kind of look at the pictures, um, try to make it look like the p-value is going to be smaller than alpha, and it certainly will be. Okay, let's get that p-value. Um, this is a probability value. Probabilities for the normal distribution are table A1. You just look up your z-score. There's no degrees of freedom, so it's easy. Go down to 1.8 and over to 0.00, which is the very first column. And what you see there is um, 0.9641. So that's the area to the left uh, of 1.80. And as, as we said, this is a this is a right tail test, so we're going to have to use the complement of that left tail. So um, for our p-value, we're going to have to do 1 minus 0 0.9641, which is going to come in at 0 0.0359, I think. So there's your p-value. And just wrap it up with a little conclusion, the p-value is uh, 0.0359, and that is less than 0.05, which is our alpha. Remember, we only look at the first two digits um, in the p-value to compare it to alpha. So I'll go ahead and do what I have often done, and that is just to kind of minimize those first two digits. 0.03 is less than 0.05. When it's less, We always reject the null hypothesis and support um, the alternative, which had said that the proportion was greater than 10%. We just need to put that in as a conclusion, referring to the proportion of whatever it is. So here we'll say the data support the claim.
uh, that more than 10%. of California job applicants um, test positive on their drug screen. Okay, so we're going to continue on here uh, to the next problem. Uh, we're going to test a hypothesis uh, using the data that were on cadence, which is the, that those numbers about how fast men walk, <laughs> and with a five percent level of significance. So we're trying to remember that our alpha is 0.05, okay. and again, you've got a kind of a summary down here. The null hypothesis has to be mu equals a value. That's a single population mean. Criteria that the sample size is bigger than 30 or the population is normal. We already had that bell-shaped histogram. So we're going to be able to say it's normal. And when we work with means, we'll do T statistics here. Um, N minus one degrees of freedom. And table A3 is where the p-values come from. T distribution p-values are all from that table. Okay, and then um, I've already copied down the uh, statistics that we uh, computed on our calculators for the mean standard deviation and sample size. So the null hypothesis, as you can see above, should be mu equals some value. And um, so I can write that. And the alternative has got to be less than, greater than, or not equal to that value. And of course, right here, it says that the mean is greater than 0.92 strides per second. That's an alternative hypothesis. And then null would just say equal. Like that. Criteria, remind you again, n is 14. That's too small. Um, but um, the histogram Um, is bell-shaped, not perfectly symmetric, but pretty close. Bell-shaped and gives some evidence for normality. So the test statistic, as we had up above here, uh, this thing is what we're about to compute. Um, so we're calling it little t with a ts next to it. We just put that formula down, x bar minus mu over s divided by the square root of n. OK, so the x bar from up above was 0.951, which um, and we're assuming the population mean is 0.92 in the null hypothesis. Uh, sample standard deviation is 0.049. And that's over the square root of n, and n is 14. Okay, so I'm going to smush, smush a little bit of this together to make some space. And then so we got that. Um, the answer to this is, should be 2.367. I'll just say 2.37, I think, which is two standard errors. So that seems significant, but you never know with the t distribution, especially the small sample sizes. So let's get our critical value next. So um, critical values come from table A2 for, for z and t. So T distribution does have degrees of freedom. And we know N minus one is 13 because our sample size is 14. Um, our alpha, well, I know I pointed it out, but I'm looking for it again. Yeah, up above it was 5%. And it's a one tail test. So here we're going alpha 
equals 0.05 one tail and 13 degrees of freedom. So if you look that up, you should see 1.771. And so there's your critical value. And once again, probably I'll draw you a little picture for this as I can. And so this defines sort of what statistical significance is 1.771 standard errors for our T critical value. Area of the tail here is alpha. Okay, now our test statistic was 2.37 here. So maybe just kind of point that out. There's our T test statistic in the tail makes it statistically significant. We still need our p-value. So um, once again, I'll draw a little bell curve here and um, put down our test statistic. Again, this was the 2.37 on a t-distribution and the area of that tail will be our alpha. Okay, so popping over to table um, A3 for the T distribution P values, degrees of freedom go across horizontally. So again, it's 13 degrees of freedom still. Um, our T test statistic is, um, we're gonna round this to 2.4. That's the 2.37, getting rounded to a 2.4, because that's how the table works. Okay, and so you dial that in, you should see 0.984. But remember, we're doing a right tail test, and these tables only give left tail areas. So the 0.984 refers to the area to the left. And so alpha will be the complement of that. Sorry, um, did I put alpha up there? That's a p value, I'm so sorry. Uh, so our p value will be um, one minus 0 0.984. Uh, and that's gonna be 0 0.016. So that's the p value on that one. Okay, and then we make our decision. So the p-val is 0 0.01, and then the six will sort of obscure, and we're comparing the 0 0.01 to the 0 0.05, which is our alpha 0 0.01 is less than 0 0.05. And as we've said many times, less means reject the null hypothesis and support the alternative. These go together. Okay. The alternative said that the cadence on average is greater, the mean cadence is greater than 0.92 strides per second. And that's what we'll say down here, the data support the claim. Okay, so there you go, done.
All right, so we're going to go to the next one. Um, this one's going to be categorical data again, kids that um, there's two variables, kids that uh, were exposed to DARE or not exposed to DARE, and the number who use marijuana, just using marijuana is a categorical variable. So um, we'll go ahead and jump in categorical variables, um, the, whether you use marijuana or not. Um, is going to, and there's two groups, so it's going to be two proportions, P1 and P2. And we're going to test the claim comparing the two population proportions. Um, this is one that has the P bar in it. There's going to be a P hat one and a P hat two. The null hypothesis is going to be the P1 equals P2. So this difference down here for P1 minus P2, that's going to be zero. Um, and again, we have to get the P bar and the Q bar on this one. So you see that null hypothesis will go straight to that. Um, and also the criteria for normality, um, you need at least 10 successes and 10 failures in each sample. So let's jump right in. We've got DARE kids. Okay, now success unfortunately is using pot. So the successes, if you check, there are 141 of those here, right here, that use pot. So 141. And then the fails would be the complement. So the, altogether, there's 288 dare kids. Um, and you're subtracting out the successes to get the fails. So that's gonna be um, uh, 147 looks like, so, which is greater than or equal to 10. So both of these are greater than or equal to 10. With the non-DARE kids we have checked out, good to go. Um, let's do the DARE kids and move this a little bit. Um, so we'll do the DARE kids next. Sorry, the non-DARE. Okay, so the successes, um, if you check again, um, you'll see there were 181 successes out of 335. So um, 181, the fails are everybody else. So that'll be 335 minus 181, um, which comes out to one, 54. Again, both of, these, both of these are at least 10. That's the rule. So we can um, say yes, the criteria are satisfied. We're good to go on both of these. Okay, now they want to test a claim that the proportion of kids who smoke pot is lower for the DARE kids. So um, we'll do the DARE kids first because they were given first here in the data up here. So let's just go ahead and set up the hypotheses. As, as you saw also, um, null hypothesis here would be that the proportions are equal. So you can just set that up immediately, nothing to worry about there. Null hypothesis is um, always P1 equals P2 on this one. Okay, and then um, the alternative is, I think they said the proportion of kids smoking pot is lower for the DARE kids. Okay, so these are the DARE kids. And the other is the non-DARE. Okay, and then the sample proportions. Well, the P hat one is the successes in the first sample which is 141 out of 288. So we'll figure that out. And P hat um, two successes in the second sample were 181 out of I think 335. Okay. So um, when you run the numbers for P hat one, it's about 0.49 now. P hat to about 
Okay. And then, then we pool these for the P bar, which is going to be the, the total successes over the total sample size, uh, which are just the numbers we just used in these two proportions. Now we're combining them. So um, the, the two, the number of successes in the two samples were 141 plus 181. And the cumulative sample size together was the 288 for the first one plus the 335 on the second one. So that works out to um, 0.517. And of course, we got to do our Q bar, which is 1 minus P bar. So 1 minus 0.517 comes out uh, to 0.483. Like that. So we got our P bar and our Q bar. Um, all right. So then the test statistic. Um, this is this is proportions, and with proportions we always do Z. So Z test statistic is going to be the formula here as above: P hat one minus P hat uh, two minus the difference of the population proportions, which are supposed to be equal. That difference will be zero. Okay, and then down below, we've got this thing with the P bars and the Q bars. Like that. So putting in the numbers. So I'll just put 0.49 minus 0.54 minus the zero. And down below, a little messier. I'll put the square root in last. So I've got a 0 0.517 times 0 0.483 uh, over the N1, which was the 288. And then plus, same numerator, 0 0.517 times 0 0.483 over the other sample size, 335. Okay, and then big square root. And maybe a little cleanup work here, just real quick. Something like that. And um, so that's a mess. And this comes out to negative 1.25 approximately. Like that. Okay. Any, um, I was going to do a little bit more cleanup here. Sorry. <clears throat> here we go. All right. So, yeah, like that. Okay, now it does ask for our critical value next. So again, it's a Z distribution. Those are the easiest ones. So to table A2, um, the degrees of freedom, Z scores don't have degrees of freedom. So we just go down to large, which is where the Z scores are. And our alpha have no idea what it was. I can see it's a one tail test. And yeah, I don't see it. I might have deleted it at one point when I was cleaning up this document. So um, let's go ahead and um, yeah. So I think we use a 0.05 originally. So on this one, let's just make a note to use um, alpha equals 0.05. And of course that won't happen on your exam, but I accidentally deleted it when I was cleaning up this document. So <coughs> it's a 0 0.01, 0 0.05, uh, one tail. Okay, as such. 
which I think is that same Z score we keep seeing, which is a 1.645. And we're gonna be careful on this one because this is a left tail test. Um, the alternative hypothesis is pointing left here. So this is a left tail test. Okay. And so when I draw this, and I'm gonna once again do a little more uh, cleanup just to make some space for my drawing. Okay, so. Okay, so let's go ahead and put our little bell curve over here. And the same critical value we've been using again and again for the Z stuff. Um, it's not very good. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna rotate this. A little better. Okay, so 1.645, but it's going to be negative because it's a left tail test. Okay, and then the negative, that's our, that's our Z critical value. And then the test statistic you can see is not making it into the tail this time. Okay, so here is where our test statistic is. Um, remember the tail um, at the critical value is alpha. Oops, didn't mean to do that. From the critical value, that tail is alpha. So I'll denote that. Oops. And the alpha is 0.05. And um, so we know the p-value, because the p-value starts at the critical value, the p-value is going to be bigger than 0.05, which means we will not reject the null hypothesis this time. Let's go ahead and lay that down here. So one more distribution. Um, with a test statistic, which was not very strong. It was a negative 1.25 for our Z test statistic. Like that. Okay, um, this one's nice because it's a left tail test. And on left tail tests, you just go straight from the table. So table A1 is for the normal Z distribution. And our Z score is negative 1.25. So we go down to negative 1.2. Top row for the hundredths place, 0 0.05. Like that. And so um, you see a 0 0.1025 there which is our p-value. It's a left tail test, and these tables only give left tails, so that's about as easy as it gets. Okay. It's a big p-value. Um, Can be bigger than our alpha. So view the p value is just a 10%, a 0 0.10, which is greater than 5%, 0 0.05, um, which is our alpha greater. It means we are not going to get what we want on this one. That means we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And we don't support the alternative. Uh, H1, which had said, I think that the proportion of kids on DARE that use pot is lower than the proportion of kids who never were on DARE. So um, that's what we'll say, the data support the claim. Sorry, the data don't support the claim. Uh, 
that um, the proportion of um, pot smokers, <laughs> ah, no, nah, hang on. The portion of kids on the who use, who were on the dare program. I'll just say who did the dare program. Um, the smoke pot. Um, is lower uh, than for other kids. Okay, we can't support it. No data, DARE program loses their funding and I don't think they exist anymore because of research like this. We'll just pause for a moment. Okay, so we're going to do this next one. Um, uh, this one uh, looks like it's got a couple of uh, sample means here. So that should be your clue right there that this is going to be a, a hypothesis test about two means. Uh, it says the article Workaholism and Organization and Gender Differences gave the following data on 1996 income for random samples of female and male MBA graduates from a particular Canadian business school. All right, so <clears throat> you can see that, that the females uh, on average are making um, substantially less money. And uh, so we're gonna test the claim at 6%. Of course, that's just sample data. So we don't know if it's true in the population. Testing the claim at 6% significant mean salaries for females um, are just different, but again, that's in the population, not in the samples. So <clears throat> we're testing a claim about two means, mu1 and mu2. The null hypothesis is mu1 equals mu2. And you see the criteria for normality um, that both sample sizes are greater than 30 or that both populations are normal. Um, we've seen this test statistic before, just as a reminder, because the null hypothesis test says that mu1 is equal to mu2, that the difference here between them would have to be zero. Okay, um, degrees of freedom are provided for this problem. And uh, p-value in table A3, that's the t-distribution p-value table, that's right. And same as always on how we make our conclusion. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We already know the null hypothesis is that the two means are the same. And that the alternative came from this statement that the mean salaries are different. So that's just not equal. Okay, and then the criteria for normality, we'll just check those sample sizes real quick. 233 and 258, both those are bigger than 30. So that checks out. And then uh, the test statistic, I'm just copying down now from this formula for the test statistic. So um, here it comes. <clears throat> okay, so the sample means, let's go dig those up. Um, the sample means were 105, 156. Minus 
133,442. The difference between the two population means is zero according to the null, uh, null hypothesis. And then <clears throat> standard deviations are also pretty big, um, 98, 525. squared over N1, which was 233, plus the other one, <clears throat> which is uh, 131090, and squared over N2, which is 250, right? 258, that's a mistake up above. Right here, that should be 258. Okay, and so then we get a 258 down here. Okay, so um, you can run the numbers on this. Um, it comes out to negative 2.72. Okay, and now I'm going to tidy this up a little bit. It's kind of large, so I think I'll shrink it down. <clears throat> That'll work. Okay, and then um, critical value. So we have to go to table um, A3 for sorry, table A2 for the critical value. The degrees of freedom are supposed to be, you see right here, 473 on this one. Um, so I would go down and look for a 473, but we're gonna have to use 500, which is the closest one in the table. Um, and I think the alpha was 0 0.06, let's verify that. Yeah, way up here, 6% significance on this one. So um, our alpha, is 0 0.06, and I think this was a two-tailed test based on the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so um, when you look that up, you should get um, 1.885. And then I think I'll just do a little sketch just to put all this together here. Um, this will be plus or minus, so it's two-tailed. So we get a positive 1.885 critical value and the negative one. And then, of course, um, our test statistic was negative 2.72, which is going to land in the left tail over there. I don't know if I can squeeze that in, but I'll just put a little dot down here with an arrow referring to that. That's the uh, T uh, test statistic out in the left tail. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Um, next thing is uh, we're going to need that p value. So let's do that next. So again, our test statistics negative 2.72. So T test statistic. Um, table A3 has the p-values for T distribution. Degrees of freedom goes across the top on this one. So we're gonna have to go out. There's a 100 and then there's an infinity. 
you know, technically the degrees of freedom are 473 because that's what it says. And then we'll just put in parentheses the infinity, which is what we have to use. Then the test statistic, we can go down to the negative 2.7. Um, just to the nearest tenth here. And let's see here. <clears throat> so that should give a 0 0.003. So that's the area of that left tail. But it's not the p value because we have to double it. It's a two tail test. Okay, so the p val is two times 0 0.003. So that'll be 0 0.006. <clears throat> okay, and then the conclusion here. I'll go ahead and obscure that six. and say that that's effectively 0 0.00 as far as the comparison to alpha goes, 0 0.00. I think the um, alpha was 0 0.06. So that's our alpha. And because it's less, we reject the null hypothesis. Support the alternative. which had said that the two um, mean salaries are different for men and women. And so we'll just wrap it up with that statement. I guess this is one way to say it, that uh, on average, um, getting different salaries uh, for the women as we got for the men. So that, that's one way to make a conclusion there. Okay, um, <clears throat> so we're good to go. Um, I think we'll go ahead and squeeze in this chi-square test real quick. So uh, let me just go ahead and uh, read this. So it says the article factors associated with sexual risk taking among adolescents from this article examine the relationship between gender and contraceptive use by sexually active teens. Each person in a random sample of sexually active teens was uh, classified according to gender and contraceptive use. And we test the claim that contraceptive use is independent of gender, gender at the 5% level of significance. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a test for independence with a chi-square test. It's right-tailed every time. Uh, the null hypothesis says the two variables are independent, and the alternative says they are dependent. Um, first, the, each observed frequency uh, in the table, the expected frequency has to be computed here, and the chi-square statistic is this one. Um, the requirements for the test is that each expected frequency has to be at least five. Um, and the degrees of freedom here are rows minus one times columns minus one. And again, it's always a right tailed test. We get our critical value from table A4. Um, you reject the null hypothesis and support the alternative if the test statistic is greater than the critical value. So um, 
null and alternative hypotheses here. The null hypothesis was one of independence. So here you would say that gender uh, and contraceptive use are um, independent. Okay. And then the alternative would just be that they are dependent. Okay. So now it, the next thing you have to do is get the row and column totals um, in on the table um, and compute the expected frequency. So let's go ahead and work on that table now. So if you add up um, rows and columns, um, the row totals we can put over here on the right. Okay. Um, the first row, the 210 plus the 350 add up to 560. Okay, the second row, the 190 and 320 add up to 510. And the third row, 400 plus 530 better be 930. And if you add those row totals, um, you'll get 2,000 people in the study. Okay. Now um, you can add them up another way, just the total number of females. Um, and if you look, it looks like there are, those add up to 800 females. And then the males um, are, there's got to be 1,200 because we know there's 2,000 people like that. Okay, so <clears throat> that's that. We need our expected frequencies next. So, and these work out real nice um, because it, everything ends up being a whole number. So um, just let me just point to a couple of these and then I'll fill in the rest. Okay, so on this one here, our expected frequency has to be the row total. Again, the formula right here, we're going to do row total times column total over grand total for the expected frequencies. Um, so on that one, the row total is 560, the column total is 1,200, and the grand total is 2,000. So we'll just multiply that out. 560 row total times column total, 1,200 over grand total of 2,000 people. And when you do that, it turns out to be an even 336. Okay, so I'm just gonna squeeze a little 336. Notice that's not too different from the 350. Okay. Um, maybe let's do another one on the other side of the table. So how about this 190 over here? Um, oh, didn't mean to do that. Okay, so on that one, we observed 190. The row total is 510. The column total is 800. And the grand total is 2,000. So we multiply 510. Time, that's row total times column total, 800 over grand total, which I think was 2,000. And if you do the math on that, um, I think we're going to get 204. So I'll squeeze that in down here. Like that. And um, so there you go. I think we can just squeeze the rest of these in. Um, that's how they're computed. This, this is also an expected frequency, put an E there. Okay, and the expected frequencies, remember, all have to be at least five. So far, we're looking pretty good. Um, the rest of the expected frequencies are 224 for this first one. And then in the second row, there's a 320 with an expected frequency of three, uh, 306. There. 
Um, then in the last row, 400 observed, there were 372 expected if the variables are independent. And finally, 530 observed, 558 expected. Like that. Okay. And then um, we'll go ahead. So we've got all the expected frequencies. And so the next thing you want to do is um, get the, uh, the chi-square statistic computed. So I've got a table down here to fill in. And um, let me just go ahead and check this out. The question 35 is saying, are the requirements satisfied here? Um, and remember that was that the expected frequencies all had to be at least five. So the answer to this is yes. Um, each E that we computed is at least five. Okay, and then we can go ahead and fill out this table. Okay, so I'm gonna go down in columns and put in first, the first column of observed frequencies were 210, 190, and 400. So I'll put that in. Okay, then um, the next three observed frequencies, we'll do the second column here. So you see the 350, 320, and 530. Okay, so those are the observed frequencies. Now we need all the expected frequencies corresponding to the observed frequencies. So um, looking at the uh, first column here, um, we're looking at the 224, the 204, and the 372. So again, 224, 204, 372. Okay, and then the last three uh, in the second column over here are 336, 306, and 558, okay? Expected frequencies. So again, 336, 306, and 558. Okay, so that's done. Now we need to compute the contributions of every outcome to the chi-square statistic. So here in the first row, we're computing O minus E quantity squared over E. So the first one, the O is the 210 minus the E, which is 224. Let's square that and divide by 224. So that's a little messy and I am going to keep like four places after the decimal. So that's gonna be even worse. So when you compute that, um, you're gonna get 0.875 and it, there's also, I'll put an O at the end. So 8750 for the first one. Okay. And then let's do the next one. So here, um, the observed frequency is 190, but we expected 204. Square it and divide by 204. And there you should get 0.9608. Okay, so that's that second one, 0.9608. I'll go ahead and uh, just assume you can do all of these. The rest of the values are 2.1075. Um, 0 0.5833. 0 0.6405. And the last one is 1.4050. like that 
And then you need to total this up. So this right here would be the sum. And this is a chi-square statistic when you add this up. So the chi-square is the sum of what we just did, which were the O minus E um, square over E values. So you're just adding these up um, in this last column. So the total is 6.5721. There you go. So that's our chi-square test statistic. Here you go. Now, the degrees of freedom for the test, I'll remind you, are rows minus one and columns minus one. Now, this is a little tricky because um, you don't want to count the totals that we added. So if you notice, there's three rows here and only two columns of data. Sorry, just here, two columns of data, three rows. OK, so all we got to do there is just put in those two numbers. Um, let's go and say there were three rows and two columns. So this is just two times one. So you have uh, two degrees of freedom. Okay, now um, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you the p-value, but you're not gonna be expected to do this on the exam. Okay, I'll do, I think I'm gonna just give you the p-value on the final. So you'll just have it. Okay, the test statistic was 6.7, sorry, 6.5721 up here. And here's our p-value. And it turns out that the p-value, hang on, is 0.037, which I will provide again on the exam. So you don't have to worry about that. OK. And I'll tuck this over here. Now for the critical value, um, this is gonna be the chi-square table for critical values. And, and I think that's table A4. So for table A4, uh, that's the chi-square critical value. The degrees of freedom, remember, are just two, okay? And our alpha, I think, think is 0.05, but I'm going to double check that. Right here, 5% significance. So um, we just do a 0.05 alpha. And with two degrees of freedom, you'll see a chi-square statistic there of 5.9915. Okay, so maybe one picture to wrap this whole thing up here. So we've got our test statistics, sorry. Um, we have our critical, actually, I'm gonna steal the other picture. It looks better. So, and I wonder how much I'll steal. Hmm. So, okay, so that's my test statistic. Um, and, the, and I'll erase, I think, some of this. Maybe move that out of the way and put in our critical value. So the chi square critical value is five point something. So this is 5.9915. Again, that's the chi square critical value. And then your, the uh, test statistic, I'll just move a little bit over to the right here, maybe make it a different color, and just point out that it's going to be bigger than the 5.9915. So I'll just kind of do that, I guess. So that's this guy. That's a chi-square test statistic. It falls in the tail. OK, 
And I guess I'm supposed to get the p-value. So, um, hmm. oh, I already gave that. Yeah, so we're good to go. We're going to reject this p-value is going to be less than the alpha. So let's just go and fill that in here. The p-val was 0.037. Again, I will provide that. So the 0.037 is less than 0.05. Again, just look at the first two digits on the 0.037. Don't, know, don't look at that seven, basically. Okay, just look at 0.03, less than 0.05. That's your alpha. If it's less, then you always uh, reject the null hypothesis and support the alternative. Okay, the alternative H1 had said that the variables are dependent. Okay. So yeah, um, looks like uh, contraceptive use is dependent on gender. That some, someone's more faithful about using contraceptives or making sure it happens. Um, who, who is it? So if you look at the data, um, the number, oh, looking at the data, if you, if you look at the number that had the biggest part of the chi-square statistic here, which made the chi-square statistic large, is this 2.1075. That contributed more than anything else. It was these, this 400 um, people when we should have only have seen 372. What is that? Right here, 400 women using contraceptive always <laughs> when we only expected 372. So, um, and the men sort of underperform in that regard. We see um, <laughs> 558 using it always, but we actually, um, well, is that right? No, we observed 530, but we expected more. So, uh, that's a little bit of an underperformance for the men. Okay, so um, anyway, we can we we have pretty good info here that these are dependent variables. I'll go ahead and say it. Uh, the data support the claim. Um, that let's see, contraceptive use. Um, is dependent on gender. Oops. So there's an explanatory variable that actually explains something. Okay, so I think we can move on past that one. Here's the last problem here. We're gonna do analysis of variance. And it's about a super exciting topic, which is cardboard boxes. Basically, you've got five type, sorry, four types of cardboard boxes. And you've got the mean strength. I don't know if this is in pounds or ounces or what. We'll pretend it's pounds. So this is how much weight you can actually stack on top of the box, I think. Um, I've got the mean weight. And then uh, from six boxes in every case, and we have the variance here, which is the square of the standard deviation. So we're going to be doing analysis of variance, which uses variances, not standard deviations. We're going to test the claim that the mean compression strengths are all equal. And we'll turn over to 1% level of significance. So the bottom line here is that we're going to compute this F statistic. And we have to remember what these two variances are here. Uh, but once you do that, um, this is actually pretty easy. Uh, maybe let's identify the number of samples. So there are k equals three, sorry, four samples. Um, each of size uh, n equals six. Okay, so we got to remember K and N will come up in some of the formulas. You can see that they both come up in the degrees of freedom and that N comes up in the F statistic. Okay, 
So just sliding on down, the null hypothesis is that um, the mean weight is the same for all four types of boxes. You can just keep it simple and say that all the means are the same. Okay, four means, we're testing them all at once. The alternative, they don't all have to be different. You just need one to be different to make this untrue. So we just say at least one mean is different. Okay, and then S X bar squared. So S X bar squared, if you think about this, sort of defines itself. It's the standard deviation. We always use S for standard deviation of what? Well, the X bar values, and then we have to square that, okay? So what we would do is we would go to these X bar values that were all given here and put them all into your calculator as if they were just new, fresh data and get the standard deviation and then square it. So um, when you do that, um, and I'm going to do this without any rounding. Okay, so um, when we get that standard deviation, it turns out that the standard deviation of the sample means is 39. Um, point two eight nine two. Um, but we have to square this again. It's it's um, the variance that we want. This is analysis of variance, so we'll square that, and in the end, you get fifteen uh, forty three point. Um, we'll say six four three four. Okay, so. Let me fix this up here. There we go. So um, that's the standard deviation of the sample means squared, which becomes the variance of the sample means. Now we have this other variance, which is the mean of the S square values. So basically, if you go back up and you double check all these S square values, here, we have to average those, so nothing more than add them up. And there's four of them, so we'll divide by four. So that's all that's going to happen in this next step. The mean of the S square values, I'm going to go ahead and just paste it in. I think I have it here. Maybe not. OK, I don't. So let's go ahead and put them in. OK, so the first one is the 2166.90. Second one is 1627.32. The third one is 1383.84. And the fourth one is 1589.62. And again, we're averaging these four numbers. So we're adding them, dividing by four. Okay, so um, the average comes out to 1691.92. Okay, so again, that's the mean of the variances. Okay, now the F statistic, you can see down here, I've got all set up. So the F test statistic is the common sample size. And just as a reminder up here, um, there's four samples. Each of them have size six, and that's our common sample size. So we're going to use six for N. I'm going to move that down a little. Okay, so six for n, and then the standard deviation of the sample mean squared, or the variance of the sample means, is this number up here, the 1543. 
So we'll paste that in. And then we divide by uh, the mean of the variances, which is this number here, 1691.92. Okay, and let's see how that comes out. Okay, so I get 5.4742. Okay, so that's our test statistic. And we're going to get a critical value and a p-value. So um, the uh, critical value and p-value both are going to require degrees of freedom. So for the numerator, that's this variance on the top. Um, there are um, that's the this the variance of four means. Um, so you remember that k is the number of samples. So up here you see k is four, four means and three degrees of freedom in the variance. So that's four minus one is three, that's that. Degrees of freedom two, again, K is the number of samples, there are four, times N minus one, that's your common sample size. Um, each sample has a size of six, and the variances in those samples have five degrees of freedom each. So that's why we're doing six minus one there. So this in the end, this is just four times Five, which is 20 degrees of freedom for that denominator. Okay, now um, we're going to plot this test statistic and represent our p-value. So here's the distribution. Um, let's see, I don't need that critical value yet, so I'm going to keep this out for a second. Um, my test statistic is 5.4742. So let's just set this in here somewhere. 5.4742 is our F um, test statistic. Okay. And then we're going to need, of course, the, the area of the tail there is our p-value. So I'm going to just kind of try and shade that a little bit. It looks pretty small, but this is just based on me sketching, and I really don't know how big it's going to be. So the p-val will be this tail, okay? And while I'm at it, let's go ahead and figure this out. So um, just as a reminder, Desmos has a p-value calculator um, that I've set up. So I'm gonna go into, let's see if I've got it open here. There we go, F distribution. Um, I think I can just dial in my degrees of freedom. The numerator were, was a three degrees of freedom. And um, I'll dial in 20 degrees of freedom for the denominator. And you can see how the distribution changes as I do that. Right there, 3 and 20. And then I think it was 5.4742 for the test statistic. So let me delete what's here. So 5. Uh, still got a problem seeing this. Hang on. 5 point. Okay, oh, there it is. 4742. And looks like um, you can barely see that that's shaded there. And um, that the p value down here is the 0 0.00652. So we'll make a note of that. I'll probably just call that 0 0.0065. Okay. Um, now I'll just give you the p value on the final. You don't have to, um, you're not going to be able to, to compute that without a computer. Okay, now we're going to get a critical value. So I'm not sure um, what it is currently. So we'll have to look this up. Just as a reminder, um, our alpha is 0.01 here. Uh, and the degrees of freedom are for the numerator 3, we said, and for the denominator 20. That's these values we just computed up above. Bring them down for the table. Okay, so um, we've got three and twenty. We're going to have to pop over. And again, this is an alpha of, of 0.01. So 
So we're going to pick the right page on the table. Again, it's table A5. So here it is. And we're going to do three degrees of freedom for the numerator, 20 for the denominator. Double check, it says alpha is 0.01 on this page. And come in to this critical value right there. So that's 4.9382. Four point nine three eight two. Which I'll put down just over here, I think. Now I'm running out of space. So I think what I'll do is I'm going to move my um, test statistic just a little out of the way and draw an arrow. Um, the four point nine three eight two we'll put in right here. And remove it uh, just a skosh. That's our F critical value. And then I'll just draw an arrow um, for the test statistic like that. So the test statistic is out there in the table past our critical value. Remember the area to the right of the critical value, that's alpha. Okay, and I think our alpha is a 0.01 on this one. Okay, and the area to the right of the p-value, or of the test statistic is a p-value, and it seems pretty clear that the p-value is gonna be smaller. So that p-value is um, 0 0.00, and we'll obscure the 6.5, just so that we don't focus on it. Oops, 6.5, my bad. Remembering that 0 0.0065 is really just focus on the 0 0.00, which is less than 0 0.01, that's our alpha. And whenever the p-value is less than alpha, as usual, we will reject the null hypothesis and support the alternative. The alternative, which had said um, that at least one mean is different, So they're not all the same. These are the strengths of the cardboard boxes. So um, we're just saying some of these cardboard boxes, some types of boxes are stronger than others. So the data support the claim that the mean weights are different for the four types of cardboard boxes. Um, and so, and then that's where you kind of go back and you just kind of look at them and you can see that, you know, there's a, there's a weakest box here that only holds 662 pounds or kilograms or whatever these are. And then the strongest one, the 756, um, is, you know, it's significantly um, stronger. It looks stronger substantially than the others. And so that's the one you want to buy as long as you can afford it. Assuming you're stacking a lot of weight on it. Okay. So that wraps it up for the final exam review. I want to wish the best of luck to you all.